Item number, SCP-142. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. SCP-142 is to be kept locked in an accessible room with the following. One table with surface area no smaller than 75 centimeters by 75 centimeters. One stool of adjustable height. One wall clock, electric, to be kept visible and running at all times when SCP-142 is in use. Access to SCP-142 is permitted only with express written consent of Dr. or other Level 4 personnel. Staff assigned to SCP-142 must not have any personal or family history of compulsive gambling nor gambling addiction. Staff assigned to SCP-142 are not to make any physical contact with the device under any circumstances. Description SCP-142 closely resembles a 1940s Black Beauty slot machine, as produced by the Mill Corporation during that era. The only observed irregularity in the external construction of SCP-142 is found in the coin slot of the device, which has been modified to accept any item that will fit in a cylindrical space 5 cm in length and 2.45 cm in diameter. When any object of appropriate size, hereafter referred to as the bet, is dropped into the input chute of SCP-142, the device may be operated as is customary for a slot machine of this model. Should the tumblers come to rest in a losing configuration, the bet is lost and cannot be recovered. However, in the event that the tumblers come to rest in a winning configuration, between two and two hundred indistinguishably identical copies of the bet are dispensed from the output chute of the machine. In the event that the bet consists of multiple objects, the output of the device, if any, consists of a random assortment of duplicates of the wagered items. Test data reveals the median payout from winning configurations to be 10 items, regardless of the number of items inserted. Human subjects allowed to interact with SCP-142 are affected by the object in three unique stages. Stage 1 begins immediately upon direct or indirect physical contact with the lever of the device. Subjects demonstrate mild giddiness and demonstrate a greatly diminished sense of the passage of time. If the subject has not exhausted the supply of betting material after 28 to 34 minutes of play, he or she will gradually enter the next stage. Subjects at stage 2 appear compelled to bet larger and larger quantities of provided betting items, 5 to 20 percent of remaining material, until supplies are exhausted. Subjects also express the delusion that they are winning more frequently as a result of their altered betting strategy. In spite of this belief, the frequency of payout seems to be somewhat reduced at this stage. Stage 3 begins once all of the subject's betting material is lost, typically 10-12 to 12 minutes following the onset of Stage 2 if no additional betting material is provided to the subject by a third party. Subjects at this stage express a strong aversion to SCP-142 and will not continue to operate the device unless compelled with physical force. Subjects also express a moderate aversion to any action which would cause an object to pass through a hole, and express a strong irrational fear that they will waste or lose something should they engage in the offending activities. Specific examples vary by subject but include passing through doorways, placing objects into cabinets, bags, or any other storage medium, use of sinks, showers, or other plumbing fixtures with drains, removing and or putting on clothing, sexual intercourse, and, most commonly, eating. Roughly 62% of subjects that reach stage 3 will expire due to starvation or malnutrition unless actively compelled to eat or provided nutrients through other means. Any subject restrained or otherwise removed from interaction with SCP-142 during stage 1 will recover in full within one hour. However, stage 2 subjects separated from the device will enter stage 3 and the effects of Stage 3 have proven permanent in all cases. Subjects in Stage 3 should be terminated at the conclusion of each experiment. SCP-142 was recovered from an abandoned antique dealership in Ohio, following an anonymous tip. Records from that area indicate that the shop owner died of starvation, roughly five years prior to retrieval of the device. Addendum 142-1 In the course of an approved experiment, SCP-142 was temporarily disassembled and each piece catalogued. 
The construction of SCP-142 proved unsurprising for a slot machine of this make and model, with two exceptions. Component 142-0046, the lever of the device, was found to contain several unexpected alloys, including data expunged. Contact with the lever has no effect when it is not connected to the rest of the apparatus. Additionally, as mentioned previously, the coin slot of the device is extensively modified to accept objects larger than coins. The most notable element of the custom chute is component 142-0524, a small chamber composed of thin pewter plates. 142-0524 appears to serve as both the holding mechanism for betting material and the dispenser for payouts. The means of interaction between this component and the rest of SCP-142 is unclear. However, due to the highly fragile construction of component 142-0524 and its presumed relationship to the device's duplication properties, further examination is prohibited without O5 consent. Addendum 142-2 With the permission of O5 Personnel may now submit appropriate materials to be used with SCP-142 for potential multiplication. Requests should be submitted in writing to Dr. Item Number SCP-161 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures All three instances of SCP-161 are to be kept in separate containers in Containment Locker 34 Zeta. Each container is to be triple locked, with all nine keys to go to separate members of the senior staff. Once every three months, each individual instance of SCP-161 is to be removed from containment. Current scheduling allows for only one instance to be removed in any given month. When removing SCP-161, the remover is required to not be a member of senior staff. However, they are to be accompanied by the three members of senior staff with the keys, at all times that SCP-161 is out of containment. The remover is to be dressed in a full environmental suit, with extra reinforcement around the wrist joints, to avoid contact. The senior staff accompanying the remover are to be dressed similarly. Before removal, a cell is to be set up for activation of SCP-161. Two D-Class will need to be requisitioned. One D-Class is to be strapped into a chair, immobilized, their left arm at a right angle to their body. It is imperative that their wrist be locked in, so that they cannot turn their hand or move the angle of SCP-161. The second D-Class is to be strapped to the wall directly in front of the first D-Class's hand. When removed, SCP-161 is to be immediately moved to the prepared room. SCP-161 is to be placed into the locked hand of the immobilized D-Class. Once the D-Class has activated SCP-161 once, it is to be removed from them and returned to containment. Both Class D are then to be returned to general populace, but are never to be assigned together. Description: There are currently three copies of SCP-161 in Foundation control. SCP-161 appears to be a brightly colored plastic child's pinwheel with a The Factory stamp on the back. SCP-161 only displays its unique properties when held in the bare hand of a human being. Approximately three to seven seconds after grasping SCP-161, the holder will find himself made aware of how to activate the device. From this point on, the holder is completely convinced that SCP-161 is capable of emitting energy pulses of varying strength. This conviction only affects the bearer, as no one else can see these pulses, nor do they appear to do any actual damage. However, anything the wielder destroys with these energy pulses becomes no longer capable of affecting the wielder, even when no longer in contact with SCP-161. Walls affected by the energy pulse can be walked through by the wielder, and living beings so affected not only cannot touch the user, but anything wielded by said beings will be unable to touch the user of SCP-161 as well. A minor side effect causes the wielder of SCP-161 to develop megalomania and delusions of grandeur. Addendum 1 Original procedures altered when a security guard with no prior knowledge of SCP-161 broke into the containment locker and began using it freely. After security contained the breach, 
Researchers discovered that if SCP-161 were not used occasionally, the artifact would begin to radiate a telepathic lure. The lure would affect those with low self-esteem and willpower, and call them to SCP-161. At that point, they would take the artifact in hand, and begin to use it as described. Addendum 2 A junior researcher attempting to cultivate the approval of senior staff noticed an unusual trend in beings and objects supposedly destroyed by SCP-161. Investigation into beings affected by SCP-161 before containment revealed all of them had committed suicide, many within a year of being affected. A review of objects affected by SCP-161 showed that, while many were still standing, most had fallen apart, and those still together showed signs of decay many years in advance of where they should be. A review of researchers who had been affected by SCP-161 revealed that over 50% of them had since died. Of those that remained, interviews consistently contained the idea that life just wasn't fun anymore. As of this finding, SCP-161 is now exclusively to be used on Class Ds, and never near support walls. Use of SCP-161's effect for the acquisition of SCP objects that create an environment hostile to terrestrial life, including SCP-2933, has been proposed by several research staff. Final approval pending. Approval denied. Item Number SCP-162 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-162 is to be kept in a sealed steel container at all times. Any handling is to be done with thick steel plate gloves and heavy body armor. Any personnel attempting to touch SCP-162 without proper protection or acting in an erratic or non-responsive manner are to be immediately removed from the containment area. All personnel are to submit to mental testing and review for two weeks after interaction with SCP-162. Description SCP-162 is a mass of fish hooks, fish line, needles, scissors, and other sharp objects in a rough ball shape, close to 2.4 meters, or 8 feet, in width, and 2.1 meters, or 7 feet, in height. After being in SCP-162's vicinity, Subjects have reported feeling drawn to the object, in order to touch it. This desire can extend for several weeks after seeing the item, becoming an obsession in many cases. The draw increases the more SCP-162 is observed, and subjects will become violent towards anyone attempting to restrain or remove them from SCP-162. Touching SCP-162 will immediately result in several hooks becoming embedded in the subject's skin. The experience is extremely painful, much more so than normal fishhooks. Struggling or attempting to escape will ensnare the subject more, likely resulting in the subject's complete entrapment on the surface of SCP-162. Subject will bleed profusely, resulting in death after a prolonged period of time. Subjects whose skin is impenetrable to SCP-162's fishhooks, such as SCP-1063, have proven to be immune to SCP-162's compulsion effects. Attempting to remove a subject from SCP-162 will result in the entrapment of the remover, or gross bodily harm to the subject's flesh. Subjects will many times cycle between expressing extreme pain and requesting assistance, to statements of pleasure and requests to be left alone, even attempting to grab an entangled personnel attempting to rescue them. Activation of SCP-1114 within the proximity of SCP-162 has proven to be an effective means of freeing a subject from entrapment, though SCP-162's compulsion effect still remains. Item Number SCP-174 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-174 is to be contained within Storage Unit 7 at Site-19. Removal of SCP-174 from containment requires the approval of two Level 4 personnel familiar with the entity. It is preferable to use personnel with high Psychic Resistance Scale scores when interacting with SCP-174. All personnel in contact with SCP-174 are to undergo psychological evaluation. 
Those who display obsessive or protective tendencies toward the item are to be treated with Class B amnestics and monitored for 72 hours. Addendum to Containment Procedures Following Incident 174-A, SCP-174 and the main chamber of Storage Unit 7 are to be monitored at all times via video surveillance. Abnormal activity must be reported to Dr. A immediately. Furthermore, a GPS tracking device is to be installed on SCP-174 in order to expedite recovery should the item translocate outside of Foundation custody. Description SCP-174 is a wooden ventriloquial figure measuring 53 centimeters from head to toe with somewhat ragged clothing and slight damage to several sections. Judging by the item's style and state of repair, it dates from the early 20th century. The eyes and mouth of SCP-174 can be manipulated by means of a mechanism inside the figure. When viewed in peripheral vision, subjects report on occasion that SCP-174 is looking directly at them, with an expression of longing or sadness. When subjects look directly at SCP-174, this anomalous expression is not visible. Viewing SCP-174 indirectly, such as in a mirror or a live video feed, appears to increase the likelihood of this effect manifesting itself. Personnel in the vicinity of SCP-174 report a general feeling of sadness or sympathy directed toward the figure, but cannot explain any reason for these feelings. Prolonged exposure can lead to personnel personifying the figure to greater extents. Those with particularly low psychic resistance scale scores will in some cases begin to act as if SCP-174 were a living being e.g. cradling it as if it were a baby. When informed of their abnormal behavior, all personnel revert to standard behavior patterns for at least several minutes. Subjects who place SCP-174 on their hand report an urge to converse with it. When questioned, they frequently report that the figure is lonely and needs companionship. The subject will also begin speaking for SCP-174 and manipulating its expression. When speaking for the figure, the subject's voice will take on a higher-pitched, childlike tone. Recordings taken with high-sensitivity microphones have determined that at no point does the figure itself actually speak or make any discernible noise. Regardless of the subject's experience, the act will be almost perfect. The conversation will quickly move toward a discussion of the figure's emotional state, particularly in relation to its past in most cases leading to the retelling by the figure of a story of how it was abandoned or mistreated. No one story has ever been repeated, and therefore which, if any, is true is unknown. Researchers have theorized that SCP-174 may have low-level telepathic abilities, as each story seems to be based around a theme that will have particular resonance with the current subject. Past this point, Subjects will show great affection for SCP-174 and will attempt to protect it from people who come too close or try to interact with it, in some cases, with deadly force. Subjects often refer to SCP-174 as their baby or use similarly strong terms of endearment when referring to it. This effect persists for several hours after SCP-174 and the subject have been separated and in at least one case the effect had not dissipated two weeks after final interaction. Whether the effect would ever have lessened is unknown, as the subject in question was terminated, owing to lack of compelling reason for further study. Subjects who are completely isolated from SCP-174 will become paranoid as to the figure's safety, and often undergo a mental collapse, similar to that observed in mothers separated from young children. Class B or stronger amnestics have been shown to be effective in curing both the obsessive effect and the majority of any resultant mental trauma. However, almost all who undergo such treatment complain of feelings of loss and can become depressive. Addendum 174-1 Experiment Log Transcription of Video Footage Subject D14285 Female 21 no history of violent crime. Supervising researcher, Dr. A. Location, containment cell A4. Researcher and staff observing from behind two-way mirror. Site 19. D14285 is ordered to place SCP-174 on their hand. 
Subject does so after initial hesitation. After several seconds, Subject begins a mundane conversation with SCP-174. After roughly two minutes, the Subject asks SCP-174, What happened to you? At which point, the figure begins to recount a story of how it was left behind and damaged in a house fire and subsequently discarded by its original owner. Note, Subject's records indicate that her house was the victim of an arson attack in 19... Subject begins to console the figure and reassure it with standard positive statements. Figure remarks that it is lonely and wants to find friends. Subject begins to punch and pound the door with their free hand. When guards enter the cell, sidearms raised. The subject recoils to the corner of the cell, cradling the figure and whispering to it. Exact words not picked up by microphone. Guards succeed in removing SCP-174 from the subject and leave the cell. At this point, the subject screams they have him, my wonderful baby, and begins punching and kicking the door in a futile escape attempt. Note: At this point, Dr. A ordered the experiment concluded. D-14285 was terminated after attempts to calm her failed. This experiment was one of the first conducted with SCP-174, before the efficacy of amnestics had become apparent. Addendum 174-2 Incident 174-A On 2000, Dr. A entered Storage Unit 7 to find SCP-174 sitting on the floor, next to its containment unit, looking directly at the main entrance door. The door to SCP-174's unit had been sealed shut, with no access having been logged in the previous week. After being replaced in containment, Video surveillance was installed within Storage Unit 7 as a precaution against future translocations, and a GPS tracking unit was attached to SCP-174. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now, and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.